I mean, surveillance itself is as old as the hills. We're looking at something that has a very long history. Governing authorities, police, intelligence, whatever, trying to get a sense of what is going on in the lives of particular citizens. When I think about surveillance as any systematic attempt to observe people um, with the aim of influencing their behavior. It seems to me that what we now have for the first time is the possibility that that systematic observation can be ubiquitous and can be 24-7. That's the main difference that comes with the network society. There's a kind of uh, anxiety, I think, of the way the internet is opening up and allowing so many opportunities for uncontrolled freedom of expression, uncontrolled sharing of information. And that lack of control is a real problem for many, I think, um, government agencies. There is something intrinsic now about our relationship with our machines, our devices. They're with us all the time. They're constantly uh, relaying back information about where we are and who we were with and what we said and what we ate and what we bought. One of the big problems with cyber surveillance, this, uh, this uh, tracking of our activity through the, through the networks, is that it's done invisibly. Given that so much traffic is now going through the net, everything, you know, things you watch, your email, your website visiting, you know, financial transactions, it becomes like a honeypot for uh, figuring out how to tap into it. China, which has instituted and managed to maintain a very strict control over both the content and the ability to access the internet. And I think, quite frankly, they treat this as their model. Many Western companies have been involved in developing the Chinese control systems for the internet. The capabilities were first originated in North America and Western Europe, the kind of the capitalist democracies, right? It was then kind of too unpalatable to kind of release, at least in a high profile way, uh, within these contexts because people would probably be outraged and they would. And, uh, uh, you know, so this stuff was kind of test marketed uh, in the authoritarian states of the world. There's an extremely thin line between various kinds of filtering and access legislation and actual overt web censorship. And the case of China shows this to be the case, that they tend to be linked. And it tends to be that once you have um, you know, uh, more extensive lawful access legislation, and once you have the ability to filter and to close down particular websites, it's not long before you have um, various kinds of web censoring. And what you're talking about then is, you know, an internet that's not really the internet as we've come to know and love it, but something that's rather more like TV. Canadians are being expected to basically do something similar that 10 years ago would have been anathema and unthinkable is now um, so obvious that we don't need to discuss it. So really, when you look at lawful access legislation, you can look at it as the specific proposals that are being made, but what this is really about is a wider campaign to control the internet. Usually to get information from uh, private actors, uh, you know, companies that we're dealing with, uh, government has needed uh, a search warrant. Uh, we're seeing in this legislation an awful lot of sliding standards, and so the standard we're seeing being advanced in, in many of these orders is reasonable suspicion. So you no longer have to believe that a bad guy is doing a bad thing, you just have to suspect that something bad is going on. What judge is going to second guess a uh, policeman? We, we've called it the spidey sense standard. Judges believe that when a, a law enforcement officer says that his spidey sense is tingling, that his years on the force justify that tingle, and they're not going to step into the shoes of the police officer. Warrants are a good idea. You know, they, are, they, are, they were there, they were invented, they were created to create within the system a way for people to keep us all honest, you know, to make sure that that indeed police officers do not abuse their power. So it's very dangerous. And there's no way of uh, safeguarding this, you know. There's no reporting, there's no way in which uh, uh, this could come to light. So uh, 
if you are going to allow this sort of access to information, uh, you have to create some boundaries around this. I have one very major concern about this lawful access bill. It does away with uh, judicial oversight around the sharing of information. To me, that's a fundamental bedrock of a liberal democratic society, basic protections for civil liberties that need to be in place in any legislation like this. It's just a, a simple but important point. I think there are really important issues for us to look at here in the um, coming together, in the convergence and uh, in the cooperation between uh, corporations and government. The second big step in all this is to establish a surveillance infrastructure within the, the network itself. So first, let's get access to the names. Secondly, or in parallel, let's establish, uh, the law would say, let's establish a full surveillance infrastructure. Uh, the fear, the Orwellian type fears that often get raised have some truth to them. There is, it really is the case that um, if you establish rules with no court oversight, if you establish new levels of surveillance within the network, you are setting yourself up for uh, uncharted territory, one that I think many find very disturbing. In order to control cyberspace, governments have to control the gatekeepers, and that's where you're seeing this type of legislation coming up, not just here in Canada, but all over the world in various forms um, that impose uh, requirements on telecommunication companies, hosting providers, internet service providers and others uh, to effectively police the internet. And what it's, what it's doing effectively is forcing internet service providers, the people who provide our access to the internet, who we trust with our information, to hand over that information to the government whenever they demand it. And it appears they're going to be helped financially in making it possible to obtain those data for the government. And what will that mean? That will mean, ever so neatly, that we pay for our own surveillance. We pay for them to check on us. Critically, what we will have once this project is concluded is a full surveillance system embedded within the network. I mean, that, that's, that's a by design, that's surveillance by design in a sense. I mean, the, the whole notion there is that we will build that in. And one of the points that I've made and others I think have made is that once it's there, it's impossible to undo. Once you build in this architecture, it's not, there's no going back. Uh, so recognizing it's a choice that will change what the Canadian internet is like. So now we have really the elements controlling the flow of information, the elements of surveillance, welded right in to the hardware. This isn't a question of big brother, you know, a person anymore. It's not even a, it's not a social entity anymore. It's technologies taken over these capacities by design. There's all kinds of problems with this legislation. We can talk about the process by which it's being introduced, which at this point is not going to allow for the substantive discussion that's really uh, needed. Now, in some cases, you might say legislation you know, doesn't need a lot of discussion, but this one really does because it really changes the relationship between individuals and the state. It's never even been subject to true parliamentary analysis with witnesses coming before committee. To at least give it the sort of vetting that I think legislation of this import deserves. These are really fundamental bills. These are bills about the shape of liberty in Canada. Uh, they deserve to have full parliamentary debate. Um, and we haven't had any promise from the government that they will. That is a huge concern, and that is a concern that should be on the lips of, of every, every citizen. I mean, if every citizen in this country asked their MP why, um, then I think we'd get in the debate. It may be for many people that there really is nothing to hide for them. However, that isn't the point. It's the fact that this kind of gathering of information will become normal, and that therefore, the, if you like, this terrain of the normal will shift. So what will then be exceptional will be something even more extreme. 
So what we expect to happen on a regular basis will be that all our information will be kept and could be used at any time. The climate that is being created around us is one that is very much generated by or encouraged by fear and uh, encourages fearful responses. I think that the discourse of fear uh, has uh, supported George W. Bush for many years. I think it, it, uh, it certainly is a, an easy discourse. It's like if every time you went into a cafe, you were conscious that somebody else on the next table was going to listen to your conversation, record it, and give it to the government. That kind of feeling will be everywhere with us when we're on the internet. Civil liberties, to a certain extent, are by design impediments to the police doing their jobs. I mean, that's, that's, that's what they do, but they're there for a reason. Uh, and we have to make sure that when we're updating our laws to deal with new technologies, that we're not also doing away with necessary speed bumps. It's always assumed that democracy is based on an informed electorate and on evidence-based proposals for legislation. In all these ways, what we're producing, not only in lawful access, but across the range of uh, issues within, those, uh, within that omnibus bill, is not a safer Canada, because there's no evidence that the kinds of proposals that are being made will produce a safer Canada. The government at the moment thinks this is a popular move. Now, they've presented this as being something that's about Canadian security, and we know that's not true. But this is, if it's presented that way, people will generally believe it. Um, so what we've got to do is make sure that people realise their interests are at stake here, not just their interests tomorrow or the day after, but their long-term interests. This could change the way Canada is as a country. We need to start saying, yeah, there's a politics to this. There's a politics to my device my BlackBerry, my iPhone, my, my computer. And they have to think long, deep and hard uh, about uh, whether or not we want to live in a society where surveillance is maximized or minimized, where the power of the state is ramped up or put under lawful controls and public oversight. And if we are building a system that doesn't do these things, then we're building a broken system. And we're guaranteeing that our civil liberties will be undermined, guaranteeing that more police will run afoul of the law, will do bad things, and guaranteeing uh, you know, a less safe society. It's messy to be in a democracy. It, it's messy to, uh, to try to come up with solutions that will uh, um, uh, indeed uh, respond to the complexity of, uh, of human experience, the way in which people uh, uh, behave in society. But we shouldn't give up <laughs> just because it's difficult to know.